Good morning, colleagues. Am I audible? Yes, uh, yes you, are. you are. Thank, thank you very much. I'd like to welcome you all uh, to this uh, first uh, workshop for our institute uh, this year. Um, let me introduce myself. My name is uh, Andrew Matota Makola. Um, I work for UWC. Uh, I'm in the unit for quality assurance and the information management within the Department of Institutional Planning. Um, our first session uh, this morning is on uh, essentials of learning analytics. As we are going back to basic, it has been seen to be befitting that we look at the essentials uh, and uh, we have a very capable presenter who's going to be taking us through the essentials of learning analytics. And she's none other than Dr. Uh, Yishan Tsai, all the way from Monash uh, University. She's a lecturer in the Faculty of Information Technology. Um, she's uh, also a member of the Center for Learning Analytics, uh, which they call COLEM. She's also a member of the Digital Education Research Group at uh, Monash University, and also an associate scholar of the Center of Research in Digital, Digital Education, and also the Center for Research in Education, Inclusion and Diversity at the University of Edinburgh. You can see that uh, she is really a formidable a person to address us in this. And the aims of this session really is to introduce us to the key concepts um, of the learning analytics, giving us examples of the tools, the current trends and challenges, um, and also looking at certain policy considerations. I hope we are all going to learn from what is going to be shared with us this morning by Dr. Tsai. And uh, we also encourage you colleagues that if you have uh, comments and questions, please place them on the chat box so that if we have time at the end of the presentation, we can be able to uh, let Dr. Tsai uh, respond to those. Uh, without uh, wasting any further time, I would uh, introduce, I will request Dr. Tsai to take the stage. Over to you, Dr. Tsai. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everybody. It is my great pleasure to be here today. Um, so Andrew has uh, given quite detailed introduction about uh, what I do, where I am now. Um, so I've been working in the field of learning and analytics for a number of years, and my own research focuses on investigating social te technical issues related to the use of data and uh, technologies in education, specifically learning analytics. And I'm also interested in how we can facilitate um, more effective feedback processes based on the use of student data. Um, so I am um, a, an educational researcher by training myself. Um, so I'm not a computer scientist. This might tell you a little bit about learning analytics as a field, which is very interdisciplinary. So I got my, uh, my master's and uh, PhD degrees from the University of Cambridge. And then I moved to the University of Edinburgh, did my postdoctoral um, uh, um, postdoctoral research, and, and then moved here. Um, so I've moved a lot uh, around quite a lot. And um, 
in, in, you, you can tell from that that um, I have perhaps a mix of accents. I'm originally from Taiwan. Um, I don't know if there's any South African element in the way I speak at all, but my husband is from South Africa. He is um, he's, uh, brought up in Pretoria. So I'm very excited uh, about this opportunity to be able to share with, um, uh, with everyone here, um, whether you are researchers or faculty um, members or um, administrators or students working uh, with student data. Um, yeah, welcome to this workshop and thank you for the opportunity. Um, so as Andrew mentioned that uh, in this workshop, what I'm hoping to achieve is to uh, bring about all the essentials about learning analytics. So this, this is about an introduction to learning analytics. And I'm hoping that in the next uh, uh, 90 minutes, now probably uh, less than 90 now, <laughs> um, but we, we, I think we end to finish in, um, in, so in my time, it will be 8 p.m. Um, so your time will be 12 p.m., I guess. Um, yeah, so hopefully in the uh, next um, an hour and a bit more, uh, we will be able to, I will be able to um, help you get a better understanding of what learning analytics is, what it can do. And I will um, start with some key concepts about learning analytics and, um, and I'll give you some examples showing how learning analytics can be used to support students' success and engagement, um, followed uh, by um, a discussion uh, about uh, the um, key challenges that we are seeing in the field uh, about learning analytics. And then um, I will also talk a little bit about the policy aspects and uh, moving on to the final part, which is about um, looking forward what's the development of the field at the moment, what, uh, what we need to be aware of. Um, so I, there will be a few polls that I will invite you to participate. And I'm also hoping that after the, uh, the presentation that I'm going to give to you, uh, we will have some time left for some group discussion. Yeah. Um, so I hope everybody can see my, uh, my, my screen. And um, right, yeah, I, I can see. <laughs> I can see the chat now. Great, <laughs> thanks, Bart. Um, okay, so uh, let me just uh, move on to the next slide. So, what is learning analytics? Um, so I want to invite you to participate in this poll. Uh, you can uh, go to this website uh, directly by typing this in, or if you have a digital device, you could also scan this QR code. Um, let me see if I can, oh, I can't actually, sorry. I, this, this was a screenshot, so I can't actually paste it in the chat. Um, Oh, thanks. Thanks, Elizabeth. <laughs> That's great. Um, okay. Um, I think I actually need to launch it. So sorry. Okay. It should be available now. If you log into this web page using the link that Elizabeth just uh, inserted in the chat or scan the QR code, you should be able to see these two questions and participate in it. Let me know if you have any issues accessing the poll. Are you able to see it? Let me test it myself. Um, it's still saying the poll is coming. Thanks, we now can see it. Okay, good.
Okay, I see that the responses have started to slow down. So I'll just give one final minute and then I will close this poll. Okay, let's view the result. Okay, let me A. Right, here's the result. So what is your experience with learning analytics? Okay, um, so we do have half of the participants knowing a little bit about it and um, some have used it even and uh, a small uh, number of people have no idea about what it is. Okay, that is fine. Um, so I hope um, in the following uh, in this session, we will be able to increase at least um, this part B yeah, and hopefully this um, people who answer A will be reduced to zero and hopefully we'll be able to encourage more people who will in the future uh, then select C. And as for this, what clouds we're seeing that data and statistics, these are really coming out as uh, the, the, the big idea that came up about when when it comes to learning analytics, the first thing that um, came to people's mind uh, is about data and statistics. And then we are seeing other uh, things as well, student data mining, classroom behavior, school knowledge, engagement, and um, that activity, risky, right? Okay, yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, so we will actually touch upon uh, pretty much everything that people have put here and uh, we'll return to talk about this. It is learning analytics um, mainly about data and statistics? What else do we need to know about it? Okay, thank you very much for participating in this poll. Um, so let me move on. So the most commonly adopted um, definition of learning analytics is that it is the measurement collection analysis and reporting of data about learners and the context for the purpose of um, understanding and optimizing learning and the environments in which it occurs. So um, I think before the pandemic started, um, we are already seeing um, a shift towards um, digital learning. And we are seeing a lot of um, um, learning happening in the online space. For example, the use of online uh, learning management systems to facilitate learning and also the, the growing popularity of, um, of, of MOOC, massive online open courses. So we're seeing a lot of data being generated through student interactions with these online spaces. And a lot of the data um, has not been used uh, adequately. And a lot of data that has been just collected and collected and collected because um, the system allows the collection, the inst institutions maybe have routines in collecting certain data. Um, but, but before learning analytics field, um, came about. Um, this was already a common practice, but um, people started to realize that actually we can do more with the data and we should really make a better use of the data to understand what students are doing, what it can tell us about the learners and about um, their learning patterns and help us understand learning in general. So learning analytics, the idea is about uh, measuring uh, what's happening in the learning space, collecting the data, analyzing it, and then generating reports that can be used to inform better decisions. So for example, if the, the, the report is delivered to teachers and um, administrators, 
um, the, such reports may be able to inform some decisions related to um, instructional design or uh, student support. Um, and if, if it's delivered to students, uh, we're hoping that this kind of report, um, the feedback about what students are doing would be able to uh, give raise their awareness of their own um, engagement with learning and for their own progress and even uh, the likelihood of success. So as to perhaps uh, trigger some changes in their learning behavior and ideally also leading to some um, development in the cognitive level. So that is uh, a very um, um, simple um, view about what learning analytics is. Um, uh, a, a learning analytics cycle uh, includes four basic elements, learners, data, metrics, interventions. So we have learners that interact with learning materials, learning platforms, and um, the others in the learning environment. And that can all contribute to certain data. For example, uh, log data, students visiting um, the um, learning management systems, they view videos, they click uh, certain uh, materials, uh, or they participate in online forums, interact with whether it's with educators or with peers. All these kinds of interactions um, leave some digital traces. So we then can collect the data, which can be further processed into uh, matrix that can then um, be used to uh, measure learning, to um, understand certain learning patterns and uh, result in interventions that uh, hopefully will then have certain positive impact on learners. So that goes on as an iterative cycle in um, a learning analytics cycle. And so essentially learning analytics is about informing uh, decision making, uh, whether it's about uh, learn, um, informing decisions related to learning or related to teaching. Um, or at the management level, uh, we can also use learning analytics to inform decisions, for example, related to um, resource um, allocation in a learning environment. Um, so, so learning analytics is about how we can move from data to action with the um, with with, with the, uh, the the result, the analytics results. Uh, what can we do? Uh, about uh, learners what, and what learners can do to help themselves um, move towards desired goals. So it's, it's not just about uh, telling us about what learners are doing, it's about presenting that picture that can help us to move towards um, certain action, desirable actions that can lead to positive change. Um, so there is a short video that I, I would like to recommend to you that you can uh, easily find on YouTube by just typing learning analytics in a nutshell. Um, it's a three minute video uh, introducing some key concepts about learning analytics. And in fact, if you don't have time to stay throughout this workshop, um, I would just like to recommend this video to you to watch if you don't have time to um, stay, um, yeah, to, to stay with us to the end. Okay, so Moodle, uh, this is just an example that um, these are screenshots that I took from uh, my own course that is built on Moodle, a learning management system that we use in Monash. And I believe that many of you here today, you may have different learning management systems in your own institutions. And nowadays, um, learning management systems would usually come with some basic stats. So for example, here, they, these examples are showing just very basic views uh, that a particular student um, has, um, has had of um, during uh, one month's period of time, um, how many views they have had, they have had um, in this um, learning space of various materials and how many posts they have generated in overall activity. So we can see that there is no, no post generated by the student. Uh, which is not surprising to me because um, we actually had a separate um, 
online forum for students from Moodle. So the data is not uh, pulled in. But what is important here is that as an instructor, you have the knowledge of your own learning design. So you are uh, you, you need to interpret that with what you know. You you you, you don't just take what is showing to you. Um, and um, equally important is that for institutions that are adopting learning analytics, um, it's important not to use learning analytics to uh, pass on judgment this way because um, because every learning context is unique so we need to be able to to we need to consider the differences between uh, different learning um, environments different learning design and we need to also be aware that um, educators have the best knowledge to tell us what's happening in the course and here i can also see that uh, the this is just a very simple bar chart of uh, this particular student's um, engagement with the, uh, the, the uh, online learning uh, management system um, on different day. And I can see that there is a peak here, um, which uh, is again, not surprising to me because um, this is actually around the deadline of our first assignment. So I was expecting to see this, but this can be, um, how, even though it's very basic, very simple, but it can um, give us some ideas, especially when you um, when you have a big class of students. So in my class, I have about 140 students. And um, so Monash is a big university and this class size is considered small. Uh, we have uh, quite a lot of classes with 400, 500 students. So it can become very difficult to provide appropriate support to students. Now, when you start to notice that oh, there are students who seem to be disengaged for uh, a, a certain period of time, which is perhaps unreasonably long, then and, and, and it's, it doesn't um, coincide with any holiday time, then that can be alarming. Um, or if you have students who um, requires special support of your or if you're seeing certain students based on their academic performance they seem to struggle a little bit or based on their attendance they seem to be dis a, bit, a little bit disengaged then this kind of basic stats can still provide you some general idea about what students are doing so um, the purpose of me showing you this example is to um, let you know that Learning analytics is not something that is like far to reach. In fact, many of you are probably already experiencing learning analytics. Now, um, of course, there are more examples that I would like to show uh, to you later on. And this is just another um, simple example of um, students' engagement with a forum that I mentioned earlier that is separate from Moodle. It shows shows you uh, the, 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 the number of people participating in the forum, uh, the total number of views and uh, how many threads have been generated, um, answers and comments. So it just gives you a general idea about the traffic in the forum, how um, um, the uh, engagement level. So we can say that learning analytics is a feedback process and involves two types of agents. Um, so in the traditional feedback scenario, we have learners as agent B and we have instructors as agent A. Now, if peer feedback is used, then we will also have peers um, as agent A. And of course, um, in some scenarios, you have expert as agent A, for example, in, uh, in um, say, uh, exper experiential learning uh, placement kind of scenarios, so you may have some experts involved as agent A providing feedback. In learning analytics, uh, we have um, algorithms uh, participating as um, Agent A as well. So algorithms, uh, would, we, we make use of algorithms to help us um, make sense of, of um, the outputs from students and to even help us provide feedback based on that. So how a feedback process um, um, looks like is that it starts with 
some uh, distinct goals, tasks, and measurement of a particular um, course um, that we may have. You, you, you may communicate to your students about specific learning objectives and specific tasks and how you are going to measure their performance. So uh, you may have um, rubrics designed for, for your course. And learners, uh, upon receiving this information, um, they will trigger um, an, a process, an internal uh, self-regulated um, process. So um, they use their existing knowledge, beliefs, and attitudes, um, the attitudes toward learning to, to sort of interpret what is presenting to them. And uh, based on this, they may um, set up uh, certain goal, learning goals and, and then uh, some strategies and tactics um, to achieve those goals. And these will then lead to um, certain process of their learning. For example, they may uh, start working on an assignment or preparing for, for an exam and others. And so um, the, the, this whole process would then continue to lead uh, to result in this uh, whole cycle of um, self-regulation. Students, learners themselves, they will continue to regulate this whole process, examining uh, what um, sort of reflects on their own learning process. Now, externally, this this process can lead to some evidence that, um, that we can then assess. So the evidence, it may be an assignment, an artifact that the students pro produce, or it could just be um, the certain learning behavior that is observable. So for example, we have we um, have talked about locked data that we can collect in online space. So locked data um, mainly uh, shows us uh, students' behavioral engagement with those platforms, how many times they have viewed videos or how many posts they have generated in the forum. Um, so there's various evidence that we can collect um, as outputs from uh, students' learning. For example, if we use multimodal uh, learning analytics, we can also collect information about uh, the student's uh, location in the classroom, if it involves some um, moving around, if the activity involves that. Um, we can also collect information about um, their pulse to see if uh, students um, are under particular stress when certain activities happen. And I'll give you some examples later. So this kind of um, evidence can then be measured and compared, analyzed, and even uh, prediction can be made based on uh, this kind of data, which can then uh, generate certain information and be delivered to either students or um, agent A, uh, B or agent A. So if it's used by students, then it continues to, um, to facilitate this internal regulation process. And uh, if, if it's used by agent A, it can be used to further inform the next, um, the next tasks or, if, or adjust the, the, um, the goals of the, the, the course or um, the, the way to measure students. So this is um, uh, an overall feedback process that learning analytics can facilitate. Um, so instead of seeing learning analytics as a tool or an artifact, we should see it as a process, a process that involves data collection, involves measurement, involves uh, reporting of uh, student data. Okay, so we can see that there are two types of feedback loops here. Um, if learning analytics, if it's a teacher facing learning analytics, then uh, we rely on teachers to make sense of, um, of, of the feedback delivered uh, through learning analytics. So teachers would interact with the um, learning analytics um, algorithms directly and uh, they need to have uh, relevant uh, literacies to interpret the data that is presented to them. Um, and then they interact with learners. Uh, they may then use that to provide further feedback to learners. So in this circle, learners uh, interact directly uh, with the, the teacher. Um, and of course, um, they, um, they, whatever 
is produced by them uh, will continue to feed back to learning analytics. Now, if it's a learner facing learning analytics, then the cycle uh, we are seeing is, uh, is over here, that we are seeing learning analytics and learners that are interacting directly. So learners are in charge um, of interpreting learning analytics. Um, they are the ones who have to make sense of what they are seeing in, uh, uh, say, a learning analytics dashboards. So um, in, in either groups, we are seeing that learners and teachers play different roles and the, uh, the kind of um, literacies they need may vary the expectations of that. Okay, so let me show you some examples of learning analytics tools. In terms of uh, learning analytics tools that facilitate feedback for teachers, uh, the first example I want to show to you is called Loop. Um, so it gives you, again, just a, um, some general idea about the, uh, the traffic of um, students' uh, engagement based on the log data. So what kind of materials they are accessing over a period of time. Um, and you can also uh, view this uh, uh, like on a weekly basis to see um, at which point the students seem to interact with the uh, learning management system more frequently than, um, than, than on, on other days, for example, closing to lecture time, students may interact with it more. Um, you can also see whether students are having um, a catch up behavior, which will be indicated in the red color. Um, so, um, students, do they only access certain materials after the given week or do they do, they do that um, in the same week or, or even before? So this can give you some um, idea about, um, about student um, access to the materials, which is something uh, instructors are uh, very interested in. And user flow is another example. This is um, developed by um, a research fellow in, um, in Monash University. So it allows teachers to see where students come from. So we have two campuses, uh, well, actually more than two, but here it shows students in Clayton campuses and Malaysian campus. Um, so we can see uh, the uh, students grade and we can see their major, um, where they are coming from, Malaysia uh, campus or Clayton campus and, and what the uh, second major is. Um, and another uh, example here shows us that uh, it's also possible for us to collect certain data and allow say to understand how students move from one activity to another. So here, like 1.1, 1.1, .1, 1 .1, uh, this is uh, about, uh, for example, within the same module um, in the same week, you may have multiple activities. So how do students move from one activity to another and into the next week's activity and do they come back? So the red color shows that students um, go back to the previous um, activity, whereas the, the gray one shows forward movement. So this also gives educators some ideas about uh, the, the access um, patterns um, to um, learning materials and potentially helping them to, to see um, some relationships between different learning activities and, and how uh, students maybe find, uh, find um, the, they, they may make more use of certain um, learning materials to support them to work on um, the other learning materials. So you can see that connections. And here, um, the same tool, it um, offers the view of um, the uh, uh, students access using uh, a heat map to show uh, which which um, activity especially attracts most traffic. For example, 2.2 attracts a lot of um, activity, um, um, yeah, activities access. And so, so it's 4.1. Um, and the tool also has an annotation function, it allows students to um, annotate the, um, the, the, the materials that they are accessing, whether they find it particularly important or they find it confusing or, or they would like to, um, to, to get some help or they are even 
actually insert some common themselves. Um, so we can see, for example, um, this, um, this material 2.2 um, seems to uh, be particularly um, confusing to students. So as an educator, this can then give me some idea about, okay, maybe my students are struggling with, um, with the concepts that I'm covering in this, this particular step a lot. So, um, Perhaps I would start to think about uh, providing additional support or just, uh, um, just approach students directly, speak to them during my lecture to find out what is bothering them about this, um, this particular learning material, the concepts covered. Okay, and here's another example, Zoom Sense, which is, um, which is to be used for breakout room sessions um, in Zoom. Um, so as many of you are familiar, uh, probably pretty familiar with Zoom now, that um, using Zoom to facilitate breakout sessions can be quite effective, um, especially when we are not able to meet face to face. Now, the, the one downside about that is it's quite difficult for you to actually know what's happening in those breakout sessions. It's not like in a face to face environment, we can actually see what's happening just by scanning around the classroom. But um, when breakout sessions are happening, you don't know, you, you may be able to jump between different breakout sessions, but you have limited time. You can only spend maybe five minutes in each room. And, and once you enter one room, you don't know what's happening in other rooms. So Zoom Sense is to address this issue. It, it collects data. Um, about how students interact with each other during the breakout sessions and then give educators this um, dashboard showing uh, whether students are interacting in each of the groups and how students are interacting. So for example, Q4, we can see that group one, um, he is just all inactive. And you can see that indeed, there's no uh, connection between any of these students. Whereas group four, all active, we can see clear connections between all these students. So each node represents one student. It also allows us to track student progress in Google Document because we um, Google Doc Document is uh, quite a popular tool uh, that we have used a lot in our teaching, especially to facilitate group discussion. It's a space for students to work on together. So uh, it, it helps us to track uh, whether that group one, nothing is happening or in gray, or um, whether they have completed um, section one in blue, or they are, it all is still going on. And we can also see if, if groups are not discussing much and how much time um, I have spent visiting each group. So this gives um, educators some ideas about what's happening. And this example, core signals, it's a very early example um, of learning analytics. It's um, the goal is to address retention issues at Purdue University. And um, they make use of predictive algorithm in, uh, with, with this tool, uh, relying on student performance data and effort. So effort would be more about the behavioral data, written block data. They apply academic history and student characteristics. And based on all of these, um, the, um, the, the tool would be able to predict the like student's likelihood of success or failure. And then it will be indicated using the traffic light system um, to, to teachers. Um, and students themselves, they also have a traffic light system, but um, it's, it's, it's not about, um, it, it doesn't, the, the direct predictive result is delivered to educators. Um, yeah. Okay, so that is uh, another um, example, core signals. And uh, this example, Civitas, um, this is actually an example um, from uh, the University of Edinburgh, where I worked before I moved to Monash. Um, so Civitas Learning is uh, an external service provider, and we're interested in knowing what we can find out from our 65 um, online master's courses we want. And so they helped us um, to, um, to, to, to analyze our data and to make predictions on students' likelihood of continuing in, in the program. So overall, uh, we can see that um, 
it's uh, the continuation prediction is 72% is not too bad, but could be better. And um, they also gener also show us some powerful predictors. For example, um, the average number of days in row before starting um, the, the, um, the program and the modules registered for the next term, the term season um, when students are enrolled, credits attempted and others, all of these can be useful predictors to help us predict students' likelihood of, of continuing um, this program. So you may also say that these predictors can also potentially be uh, useful, um, uh, providing some uh, sort of um, um, diagnosis um, information in terms of the, the best uh, points to to intervene or, or what we can do what we can look for look into to understand potentially the the action we can take to uh, support students and um, and uh, prevent uh, the students from from failing or um, or struggling with the learning Okay, so those are just some examples about uh, learning analytics tools that can facilitate feedback for teachers. And obviously there are many more, but I'm just showing you some of them. Um, so let's have a look at some tools that can be used to facilitate feedback for students. Okay, um, so this is one example that I briefly mentioned earlier about uh, multimodal learning analytics that you can uh, collect um, multimodal data that happens in, uh, the, in, in, in the learning context, in a physical context. So this, this, um, this, is, this, this example is based in a um, nursing uh, environment, teaching environment, where students, they, um, they have a few um, simulation activities. So they, have to, uh, they have to interact with uh, a fake patient. So the based on uh, their movement around the classroom, their interactions with each other, with the patient and, and the action they take, uh, we, we, we were able to provide this dashboard showing them what they did, uh, what they have performed, what they have missed. And so this kind of information can be, um, can, can be, can be useful evidence for not only students to reflect on, uh, on, on their own um, learning progress, what they did, but it can also be useful uh, information for educators to draw on when they um, discuss with students about what they did and how they can improve further. Similarly, this example, LASI, um, it is used to facilitate student counseling. So this tool was developed in KU Leuven, um, in Belgium, and um, they, um, they, so they, 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 this is based on their first, the data is, based, is from their first year student questionnaire of learning and study skills that they have been collecting for years. And when the tool was designed, the idea was to visualize the, the result and to, to be able to um, provide some clear evidence for, um, for, for study counselors to be able to um, provide better support and advice to students. So this is just the one particular aspect of, of this survey, which focuses on time management. And it shows students uh, which group they fall seeing. So like this one says, uh, it's the student is uh, falls in this average group. And in fact, the majority of students fall in this um, average group in terms of their time management. And then shows that in previous years, if students who um, whose whose overall um, uh, study efficiency is higher than eighty percent, then uh, they are shown in green dots, and the middle group is shown in yellow dots, and the uh, bottom group is shown in red dots. And based on the uh, the, the the previous year's data, uh, we can see that students who um, who are in this green dot group, um, they, um, a lot of them uh, are able to achieve very good performers. Um, whereas uh, the um, yellow group, middle group um, varies a little bit, but we are seeing more of them um, um, attaining weak, weaker results, like not so good, um, similarly for the orange groups. So then students, even though this does not really predict what will happen to them 
nevertheless give them some information to reflect on, oh, this is what happened in the previous year. So if I um, am in this group, then maybe it's likely that I will only attain average grades. So if I want to uh, improve, then maybe I need to work on my own uh, study, my own learning skills. So that's the intention of this um, learning analytics tool. And um, feedback, this, this uh, and that other example called Ripple, um, it's, um, it's, it's to um, help students create learning resources. So uh, sort of to cross-source learning resources, students themselves, they can share um, their study notes, they can create quizzes and they can share this with peers and then peers can vote on that. And then um, they can all sort of put, uh, make use of it. They can answer the quizzes, participate in the um, in, in various um, activities that their peers generated. And then the system will um, will be able to uh, generate this result, showing them about their proficiency in various topics. And based on that, uh, it would also make further recommendations for them to improve their proficiency in uh, various um, subjects. Okay, and this tool, Synergy, it is to facilitate peer feedback. Um, so in this example, they, um, the, there are five um, areas that students are asked to evaluate. Um, and we are seeing that um, we have two, um, two uh, assessors here and they have some di disagreements um, on these two aspects. So the tool then uh, can facilitate these uh, two students to have a conversation, uh, sort of to maybe to resolve any disagreement they may have. Um, so yeah, so Synergy is a tool that can facilitate this process. And it of course also collects certain um, data that can then um, also generate some uh, analytics results and, and communicate that to teachers. Uh, so teachers will be able to see uh, um, whether students have completed this peer assessment uh, evaluation task and whether they are um, collaborating on this or not. So in fact, many of these tools, they, they, they may have both student and teacher facing um, dashboards to to all, all tools um, aspects to uh, facilitate different um, activities. Um, ACAR Writer is uh, a writing analytics. It can um, analyze a writing piece that students upload to the system. Um, it does not tell them about the grammatical errors. It's, it's more focusing on the rhetorical moves um, based on specific types of writing. So for example, we can see here, there are various symbols um, representing what um, Aka writer can pick um, up from the writing students uploads, uh, for example, initial thoughts and feedback about significant um, experience. So we can see that, uh, for example, here, starting over the semester, I've learned to overcome personal barriers, put up by myself in a new work environment, uh, blah, blah, blah. So this um, introduces initial thoughts and, and, and challenge of, um, of a new su surpri uh, surprising or unfamiliar ideas. Um, and they also give students a warning about sentences maybe too long, maybe you, uh, you, you will want to consider breaking it down. So it gives students some feedback based on that analysis about how, what they have done well, um, what they can see from, from the writing and students themselves can then uh, read about this and based on the understanding of what the teacher wants them to do with a task, then they can know, okay, have I achieved what I'm supposed to do? Um, or is there any other things that um, Aka writer hasn't picked up? And um, can, can I see that myself in my writing or have I missed it? So you can see that there is a um, nice note here uh, from Aka writer, which says that computers uh, don't uh, understand writing like humans. So Aka writer may highlight rhetorically good sentences that actually make no sense or leave unhighlighted and, 
or olive and on highlighted sentence that you feel is actually really good. And it's fine to disagree with the feedback, but um, it's also your job to check uh, your facts. So this is very important that to, to um, recognize that algorithms are not perfect. They can be helpful, but you are the one, the users, whether it's students or teachers, interacting with the learning analytics, you should um, be the one to make the best judgment. So instead of just taking everything in, you should be critical about what you're seeing, bringing in your own uh, knowledge of what uh, happened in the learning or teaching process. Okay, on task is another example of feedback for students that can be facilitated uh, using learning analytics. But this one is actually a teacher facing tool. So um, based on the data, especially uh, that we can collect through uh, learning management systems and also potentially other students, uh, other systems like student information systems that you can incorporate it into the tool, um, it pulls different sources of data into that spreadsheet and educators can also manually upload more data into um, that spreadsheet, that um, table. And then based on the uh, data, um, on task uses if this then that, a very simple rule to allow one piece of feedback um, to be generated and delivered to a large group of students. So it can be personalized this way. Instead of writing 100, 200 different pieces of feedback to um, each student, you can actually um, just, uh, just uh, write one email for it like this. Um, so you can set up various rules. If student didn't watch the first video or second or third, then um, they get different kinds of feedback. So I put all the rules in, I write the feedback uh, that I would like to send according to these real rules. Uh, if students didn't watch video one, then they get this feedback. If they didn't watch video two, they get this one. Um, if not, uh, if they didn't watch video three, then they get this one. And then I just uh, save and send. And then based on students' actual, um, interaction with the feed, feed, feed videos, they get different feedback. So overall, uh, you can see that um, the learning analytics tools, they, uh, they, 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 they can be used to generate analytics that are um, that fall in four um, areas, descriptive, diagnostic, predictive, or prescriptive. And most of them are descriptive, as you may have noticed, that they, they tell us many about what happened to students, what they did, or what happened in the past. Um, but some of them, they do um, apply uh, more advanced analytics um, uh, techniques. So for example, uh, the um, that early example, um, Purdue uh, signal, core signals that traffic light, it makes uses of predictive analytics. And um, the, the other example I showed to you that was based in the University of Edinburgh uh, using Civitas learning service, they show you um, some powerful predictors that can potentially be used to um, diagnose uh, what what happened, why, uh, why we are seeing certain um, phenomena, uh, what can be the causes, and, and potentially then it gives us some ideas about how to intervene, where to intervene and when. Um, and prescriptive analytics um, focuses more on providing recommendations, personalized recommendations to uh, users. So for example, Ripple, um, that one that facilitates um, students to exchange them and create learning materials that can give them some suggestions about uh, some relevant materials they can study further to enhance their skills. So a little bit like um, if you're familiar with Netflix, it may give you some recommendations based on your watch history and even give you scores about the match of their recommendation in your profile. Yeah, so those are some basics about learning analytics. So I want to uh, encourage you to uh, participate in this uh, poll again, the last question, um, which uh, asks what type of learning analytics is most useful to you? 
Um, so I have started this, you should be able to see the question. If you can go back to the same site that, um, that I shared with you. Okay, right. Um, let's see the result. Okay, so um, we're seeing a lot of interest in predictive analytics and we're seeing more responses coming in. Um, we have sort of almost equal interest um, in descriptive analytics and diagnostic analytics, um, less so around the area of prescriptive analytics. Um, maybe we can open the ground up uh, later for some discussion about potentially uh, what, why people are showing more interest in one type of analytics than others. Is there any particular concern that people may have? Okay, so thank you for participating in this poll. And I'm going to move on to the next part of my talk. I'm aware that I've actually used the most of my time in introducing those uh, key concepts about learning analytics, but um, I, I hope that, that was useful providing you some um, ideas about what learning analytics is and what it can potentially achieve. And that learning analytics is not something like very far from you, it perhaps is it's actually something you have already been using without knowing. Um, but it is important for us to also think about ch some challenges that are associated with learning analytics. So even though learning analytics showing promising results and a lot of exciting tools are becoming available, we're seeing that large scale adoption is still pretty low. Um, uh, but my, my colleague, um, Bart Rentis, will, sh will share with you their experience in uh, successfully adopting learning analytics in very large scale. So that's really, really exciting. Lots of precious lessons to learn from. But um, we are not seeing this in many institutions. Okay, So it's still pretty low. Large scale adoption is still pretty low. And we are seeing that uh, it's, it remains an issue in the field that a lot of um, activities around learning analytics are placing more focus on analytics and less on learning. And as we, uh, if you can recall the, the word clouds that was generated um, at the beginning of this session, we're seeing that when it comes to learning analytics, most people uh, think of data, think of um, statistics. But uh, so that that is indeed um, most where the most attention is drawn into. Um, but we need to come back to to learning. We need to remember that learning analytics is about learning is supposed to support learning and benefit learners. So let's look at some of the uh, challenges in this area. So in this paper, the authors um, argue uh, that learning analytics is an interdisciplinary field. It's not enough for us to simply uh, focus on data science, even though data science techniques are very important without this uh, without data science, we, it's, it's in fact in, almost impossible for us to facilitate um, those uh, key dimensions of learning analytics, including um, collecting data, 
measuring, analyzing, and reporting uh, data about learners. So it is important, but it's 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 not enough. We also need to pay attention to um, the theories, uh, for example, learning theories. So without theories, it's difficult for us to actually um, assign any any meaning to the data, to the patterns we are seeing, it's difficult for us to interpret what, what is happening, what students are doing. So you need to have certain theories to, for, for you to, to ask the right questions, to, to, to generate the right hypothesis to test and to, to, to be able to interpret the associations you are observing between digital traces and uh, and learning constructs, for example, intrinsic, extrinsic motivations, you know, self-regulated learning, etc. Um, it without theories, uh, it can be very difficult for us to know if certain learning processes are activated or not, and and whether what we are seeing is actually meaningful or not, uh, or, or whether it's important or not, and how learning outcomes are associated with different um, learning conditions. And of course, design is another aspect that we need to pay attention to. So design, not just about tool design, it's also about learning design. What's the learning context? What's the study design? So we need to pay attention to all these areas. Um, so don't forget that Learning analytics is about learning. And um, in this article, Pigeon Picks and Mouse Clicks, the authors argue that it's more important to uh, know how students interact with information than how much they interact with information. And uh, in this article, Embracing, Embracing Imperfection, Learning Analytics the authors are um, challenging this obsession with computational accuracy in the learning analytics field. And they um, argue that there's a need to focus on learning design, identify the right thing to measure, define the uh, impact by examining the extent to which learning analytics based feedback has led to learning design. Sorry, learning gain. Um, so it's it's not that seeking computational accuracy is not important. It is important, but we need to um, we need to make sure that we are asking the right question. We need to uh, we need to have the right priority. That first of all, we what what we are using learning analytics for is not just about data. It's about enhancing learning. So we need to get that right first. Okay, so. So following that, um, I want to highlight some of the um, aspects that are really important for us to consider if we want to ensure effective learning analytics. So learning context is important. Um, when we design a tool that is, uh, that, that is meant to be um, applied in a specific course context, then we should expect that it may not necessarily work that well in other um, learning contexts. And similarly, in different educational sectors, um, it's a very different context. K-12 and higher education are very different and different countries have very different educational systems. Um, so in our own uh, a study that we carried out in Monash, we're also finding this, that uh, we, when we are trying to understand um, our, um, the, 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 how, the educational uh, quality evaluation process was that what people uh, needed. We're finding that there was a lot of disagreement on the uh, indicators of educational quality that uh, the university has uh, has sort of assigned. And so people feel that the data in the central university provided to them did not actually answer the right questions that they wanted to, 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 um, to answer. They, in, in, instead, they feel that the, the, those questions were just being imposed on them. Um, and uh, the data that is given to them uh, does not really give a faithful picture of what is actually happening in their own um, environment. Um, yeah, uh, Muk Mukandi, yeah, yeah, I see your, um, your comment in the chat. Um, I'm happy to share the slides. So they are uh, all the papers I mentioned are referenced at the end of each slide. 
Um, and, and we are noticing this connection, strong connection between um, the challenge about indicators of educational quality and distrust. So we're seeing that a, a lot of our colleagues, they have disagreement in, um, in how in student engagement is defined. And, and we are not noticing that, of course, a lot of um, data that has been used to measure student engagement tend to focus on behavior. But then in different learning contexts, uh, there are different learning activities happening. So, um, so, so our colleagues are feeling that they're being judged unfairly and that leads to um, distrust in the way learning analytics is being used in the um, university. So that leads to the next um, topic, which is about people in the whole learning analytics cycle. It's not just about data, it's about the people, uh, about people that will be impact, the people who are going to use learning analytics. So um, this, um, this is related to also ethics and privacy issues that have um, uh, attracted a lot of attention uh, related to the use of data. And, and concerns in this area has um, really surfaced the need to focus on people. So this article, Privacy and Analytics, is a delicate issue. Um, it gives a nice uh, checklist um, to ensure that institutions who that are adopting learning analytics have um, can uh, have have uh, thought through uh, thoroughly throughout the whole process about the implications of data collection, the potential impact on individuals to make sure that the, the use of student data is in a responsible manner. And another, pap another paper uh, that uh, my colleagues and I uh, published uh, called more than figures on your laptop. In this particular paper, we discuss some prominent issues related to trust. What, um, what may make people distrust um, learning analytics? And we identify three areas of issues. The first one is that these numbers are never objective. They are always subjective because there are so many people involved in that whole process of decision making from choosing what data to collect to what um, algorithms to use to the downstream decision uh, making related to what action to take to intervene. Um, and so that's the first area. The second area of issues is related to the fear of power diminution. This is very important that we need to be aware that in an educational system, there are so many stakeholders in this system. Um, we have um, educators, we have students, we have institutional leaders, and there is an interest, interesting power relationship in play here. Teachers do not want learning analytics to be used to judge their performance. Students do not want learning analytics to be used to um, judge their, um, their own performance or, or, or engagement unfairly either. So nobody wants decisions to, to be made about them unfairly. Um, so that's, that's uh, about this power diminution. Of course, uh, it can, we can go further into discussing this power relationship between uh, service providers and uh, higher education institutions and those primary stakeholders, students and teachers. And you can even talk about this uh, relationship between algorithms and humans. Um, and another area uh, of issues that can, um, can cause trusted issues is about the approaches to design and implementation of learning analytics. And I think we have talked a lot about that. Okay, so um, apart from that, we also need to be aware that the social cultural systems are important as well. The overall um, educational system is complex and there are a lot of tension in play and we really need um, leadership to be able to address those tensions. And we also need to be aware that in different um, regions, different um, with different cult cultures um, and systems, it's very different, for example, in uh, Latin American uh, context, uh, we are seeing that um, the issue with a reliable information system and uh, policies to regulate the uh, use of uh, data uh, are currently the biggest challenge um, that can uh, impede adoption of learning analytics. So all of these um, are leading to the emergence of human-centered learning analytics. Um, and so um, I think I, I will skip this slide because I'm aware that the time is running out. 
Um, I wanted to introduce this framework to you, um, the Shila framework. Um, so this framework was developed developed based on a very large scale consultation with 89 institutions across 26 European countries. And based on the consultations, we developed a framework which considered um, six dimensions for mapping political context to identifying key stakeholders, identifying desired behavioral changes, so focusing on what changes you want to see rather than just what you want to do. And then based on that developing engagement, um, strategy, analyze the internal capacity to effect change, and, and last but uh, not the least, establish monitoring and learning framework to uh, promote continuous improvement. So this framework is to, uh, to, to be used to facilitate the development of institutional strategy and policy to make sure that learning energy can be used effectively and um, responsibly. Um, so for each each dimension, we have a comprehensive list of action points and some challenges people need to prepare themselves uh, for and some important questions to answer when um, developing policies for learning analytics. Um, so I was going to, I was planning to give some time for group discussion, but maybe considering that I'm actually running out of time, I might just, uh, uh, skip this part, but I might open up the room to everyone just to ask questions. But I do encourage you to visit this. Uh, this you can use this tool to then uh, you can drag the statements and you can even alter the statements. And, and, and really, it's just um, like a toolkit that helps you to think about all the important um, dimensions and aspects when you are considering adopting learning analytics and, and um, in a more sustainable. Um, manner and potentially to be able to scale it up to the whole institutions, then, then you need to have a systematic approach. You need to think about the strategy you'll be adopting and, and potentially also having a local policy to govern this. So this is an example uh, of, uh, 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 of some learning analytics principles and purposes that we have developed based uh, using this uh, framework. Uh, when we when I was in the University of Edinburgh, and we also have a, a detailed set of policy uh, for this. Um, and so you can see that it's important um, that from the university perspective, we needed to um, recognize that there are certain limitations with their analytics. And this one especially um, I've included here um, just to show you that um, why why having a local policy can be uh, can be very useful because again there's no one size fits all whether we're talking about a tool or a policy so at the university of edinburgh after our consultation with various schools it came up very clearly that our teaching staff were really against the idea of the possibility of learning analytics being used to to track their um, teaching activities and potentially used as a performance uh, judgment tool. So um, this was very important that we included in the principles and purposes to reassure our teaching staff that really what we are trying to do with learning analytics is to enhance learning to support learners. Now this may vary in different activities because of different culture um, and different you know, political context. Okay, so uh, just briefly looking forward, um, I wanted to highlight that uh, in the field now we are seeing deeper reflections in, um, in topics related to equity, um, diversity, and inclusion. So for example, this paper, Subversive Learning Analytics, is a very nice paper. The authors challenge the assumptions that have been baked into um, the existing practice, the social order, um, the, some of the bias uh, issues um, that we need to um, be aware of, and we need to refocus on values, human values, educational values. Um, and an another um, um, development that is worth attention is about um, AI-powered learning analytics with the growing integration of AI into our lives. We need to start to think about the politics that this will bring, how um, politics will shape the way data algorithms um, and machine intelligence are being or, or could be used in education and what 
what it will look like, what AI power learning analytics will look like, will it disrupt pedagogies or actually empower more diverse pedagogies. Um, and finally, about uh, literacies, this um, is a particular area that I am, am uh, very interested in, how we can equip users uh, of learning analytics with required skills to maximize the value that can be created. So um, feedback literacy may encompass these areas about being able to appreciate learning analytics based feedback and being able to make sense of it, turn uh, relating those computational representation into their own selves or others about what, what people were actually doing and so as to take action and to manage the effect and negotiate, negotiate some power relationships in this whole uh, feedback loop. And then there will be some literacies that are also related digital literacy data and AI literacy that we should also pay attention to. So um, finally, I, I, I will uh, leave these questions with you. Um, I think these are very important questions we should be asking when it comes to supporting student engagement and success with learning analytics. Um, so I will end my session here, and I'm sorry that I didn't manage to leave time for group discussion, but I'm happy to open the, uh, the, the floor up to everybody to uh, maybe ask questions or share your own experience with learning analytics in your institutions, um, or even some of these questions or any concerns you may have. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tsai. Um, colleagues, we've got uh, about uh, seven minutes for questions and comments. I saw one comment on the chat I don't know whether Angela, you would want to speak on that point you make there. I think it's important. And then we'll take a few hands. Um, thank you, thank you very much. And thank you for a very interesting talk. And um, you've opened my eyes to, to quite a, a number of issues that have to be considered. And what we found when we were trying to implement learning analytics at our institution, um, we're a distance institution, but that also has practical classes and um, in some forms of blended learning, was that we we couldn't develop a model that fit for fit all courses. We we actually had to involve instructors um, to decide which metrics matter. Um, and, and I think that's just one of the things that, you know, was the biggest lesson for us coming out of the process. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Yeah, we, we're seeing this um, quite a, a common um, issue and perhaps realization as well. And, and so one thing we have learned from our own local work um, is that the, it's important to offer some flexibility uh, when it comes to tool design, that it allows um, instructors to, to, um, to some extent to be able to tailor the use for their own use. So for example, on task is a very good example. It allows educators to upload additional data that maybe not, um, that, is, that doesn't exist in the existing data uh, streams. Um, but nevertheless, is something important to their own learning design. And we know it's, it's impossible to, to, to make um, all, all the uh, learning designs the same. That's, that's, that's not right either. So you do need to be able to, to offer this kind of flexibility so that teachers feel that they still remain their autonomy. Um, they are not just being given a tool that tells them, okay, you need to teach this way, or you are not teaching well, or students are not learning well because our data is not showing that. You need to actually um, give them this flexibility to make their decisions and to actually be able to make better use of learning analytics. So that's very important to also about teachers' um, sense of autonomy as well. And perhaps apart from that, we don't need to restrict to just one type of learning analysis. We should be aware that actually there are many to select from. Um, so yeah, so that should be opened up. Yes, thank you. Um, I've got two hands, Anela first, and then uh, Chloe. 
thank you thank you um dr makola what was <clears throat> um my <laughs> my question is around the uh, um the issue of interventions uh, i must say i appreciate what the power of of uh collecting and analyzing data can do but um without the interventions um that that that, that is not useful at all mm -hmm. now um, in our situation, for an example, you have um, one section doing the collection and analysis and presentation of data, and then you have other sections responsible for um, uh, the interventions. Now, I just wanted to, to hear your thoughts on how, how um, should, should, should uh, universities um, um perhaps um i don't know how to put this but the design the structural design of 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 the whole system around student support should be should should be arranged in order to be um effective because sometimes you you have this data but um uh, somebody else somewhere else is not acting on it so um, what's your thought on, on, on structural designs of, of, of um, student support systems within universities? Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for the question. That's a very important question. Um, so I wasn't able to spend that much time discussing the strategic approaches and uh, policy development around the new analytics. But one of the things that we found very useful when it comes to uh, like when, when an institution starts to approach the new analytics is to, to establish a committee of uh, uh, of representatives from a wide range of stakeholders so you you, you should have um faculty representatives you should also have some representatives for example from student services you know student support services academic um, services or and, and even from um data uh protections um offices so you need to have this uh wide range of people and including student representatives to make sure that you are hearing the voices from different stakeholders and so they may have various interests they may also have various challenges and so how do we bring people together to 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 come um to come up with uh with certain consensus and 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 to reach consensus and come up with a strategy that can really address uh, what we need to have that systematic uh, approach. I think that's the way to go. And I think what we were saying there was about these silo issues that we all have, we are all seeing in institutions, not just about data in silo, but people in silos. Thank you for that. <clears throat> uh, if you allow, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we can add uh, five minutes and we break at uh, five past 12 and then we'll have a 10 minute break. I just want to accommodate this last hand, which has been raised here. Um, Chloe, you can go ahead. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Program Director. And thanks a lot for uh, the presenter, Dr. Chai, for such a very um, interesting session. And um, I think I had, a, <clears throat> I had a lot of questions, but, uh, uh, for the sake of time, I'll maybe reduce it to um, to, 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 to one. Um, I think there are a lot of important lessons to draw from uh, your presentations, especially when it comes to um, the issues of um, um, involvement. Uh, a couple of years in this very forum, <clears throat> there was a, a presentation done on analytics um, and ethics. And I think when I when I look at your presentation today, um, there's a lot of these important things that um, you've 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 shared with us, which actually helps us to think and understand that it is not just about uh, the numbers. Uh, so, so my question, um, uh, Dr. Chai, is that um, we I, I come from the view that um, um, learning analytics should be about improving um, student success. And mm -hmm. um, if I look at the second part of your presentation, 
uh, where you started the question of um, what are the type of analytics and you will see there's a huge uptake on predictive analytics. Mm -hmm. Many of colleagues that I've engaged with, they, they always talk about the lack of uptake on predictive analytics, especially from faculty or lectures. And the nature of, of learning analytics with the view of improving student success, you cannot avoid using predictive analytics. How have you found a balance to create an interest from lectures uh, or, or faculty in, in order for them to kind of, um, um, you know, champion the kind of insights, all things um, are considered? And is it your findings that, um, there is an interest from 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 lectures uh, or faculty, or um, do you have a situation as I've observed in our um, environment where um, lectures tend to end up um, using those insights more for research rather than for mm -hmm. the the you know the purpose of driving student success? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That that's a brilliant question. <laughs> that's also a complicated question. <laughs> um, so in three minutes, I'll try my best to 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 answer this question. So um, I think part of the reason why predictive um, analytics is not uh, adopted as widely as say uh, the descriptive analytics is because there are a lot of issues not just uh, about the accuracy, that's the first one, the predict predictive accuracy, that's something people will question. But then there is also an um, issue about whether this is uh, really going to be useful from a learning point of view. We know that from management point of view, this is great because we, we can then sort of prepare uh, we can have some um, foresight about what, what may happen and then we, we try to take some action to prevent it, to address it. Now, from a learning perspective, some teachers that I have heard myself with my own ears is that the question whether this will actually take away students' opportunity to learn from mistakes. If you predict, say that, oh, you are, you're going to fail, so change your behavior now. So on the one hand, it seems great that we are actually helping students. We don't want them to fail. Uh, we, we don't want it to be too late for them. We want them to make changes before it's too late. But on the other hand, we can't also deny that students do learn from mistakes. They do learn from failures. So there is this conflict here. Now, whereas if you ask students, then they, you're going to also hear different results. Some students will appreciate this. They will think that, okay, yeah, this helped me, especially the more personalized the support is, the better for me. Every student, no fail that I've uh, heard, they all want the support, teaching support to be more personalized, more geared towards them, in the, themselves, individual needs. But they, you, you will also hear from students, uh, there will be a uh, Polar, polarized views. Some worry, some think that this will be good for them. Some worry that this would make them more anxious, especially if they continue to, you know, get negative feedback saying, you're going to fail, you're going to fail, <laughs> you're going to fail, you're fail, failing every course. They still are going to be very anxious about this. So, um, so I think the best approach um, is, uh, and that's something definitely that was taken when I was in University of Edinburgh was that we make certain resources available. We start with policies um, so that people can feel safe about how, about what the university is going to do. Um, and whoever will, will, will use learning analytics, we can feel safe based on this policy framework that it's not going to be used as just for personal interest. And there, there are certain guidance and there will be resources that students, uh, sorry, uh, institutions make available for, for educators to use. Um, so especially, I guess, for more contentious ones that we, uh, that, that need to be found out, uh, it varies in each uh, context, each institutions. And I would say that having that, that consultation is very important to learn about the, 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 the appetite of your uh, staff, um, how, how much they, you know, they, they risk appetite as well, uh, to know what kind of analytics may be more accessible to them. And so if you're thinking about 
having multiple kinds of learning analytics tools, if you are thinking about having some of them at a more like larger scale and some of them, maybe you just make them available and, and then um, teachers can choose um, a suitable one for their own use. I think having that flexibility is always appreciated by teaching staff. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. I'm sure we, we all have a, a, a quite a lot of questions uh, to ask, uh, but unfortunately time is not on our side. Um, uh, let's thank you, Dr. Atsai, for the presentation that you've made for us, quite enlightening. And uh, as we share the slides, there's a lot of resources that we will be referring to. Uh, to edify our 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 knowledge in this area. So yeah, thank you um, so I just wanted to say that I'll share the slides and I also wanted to mention that this tool I mentioned earlier is free, openly accessible. Um, so I think this could be a very useful resource for um, everyone here who is thinking about uh, promoting an institutional um, scale adoption of learning analytics. And if you are starting to think about strategy and policy, I would encourage you to access this, this tool. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's have a short break uh, until uh, quarter past. Uh, sort of for taking your time. Um, let's meet at quarter past for another session. Thank you. UWC is situated right at the tip of Africa in one of the world's most beautiful cities, Cape Town. Known as the Mother City, Cape Town is the oldest city in South Africa. We've also got the dopest mountain on the planet, Table Mountain, officially a new wonder of the world, right here in the vicinity of UWC. We've got one of the most interesting histories of all the universities in South Africa too. True story. UWC was originally established during apartheid as a college for colored people only. The first students enrolled in 1960 were offered limited training, not based on their aptitude nor potential, but simply on the color of their skin. As a heavyweight in the struggle against apartheid, UWC was at the forefront of South Africa's historic liberation. And it so is. If there's real change spilling out on the streets of Cape Town, you can bet UWS will be there too, bringing its unique brand of hope and the depth of knowledge that translates into real positive action. Maybe that's why we attract so many artists, activists, poets, world changers, and thought leaders. Right from the start, UWC fought the status quo, giving students the highest level of education possible. That's why only a decade after these doors were first opened, the institution was granted full university status and finally able to grant nationally and internationally recognized degrees and diplomas. <laughs>